Welcome to worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. My name is Reverend Jennifer Innes. It is my great joy to be the minister with this congregation of people of all ages and all ages of life. Together, we strive to live our mission of embracing freedom, loving inclusively, growing in mind, body, and spirit, and adding to the wholeness and the healing of the world. And in living out that mission, we recognize the network of relationships of which we are a part, this is the ancestral home of the Peoria people. They were among the nations who called this place home before the first Europeans came down the Illinois River. We honor the Peoria people in worship every time we gather. We honor them for who they were and for who they are today. I want to thank everybody for joining us in person and online. It is a gift to be together. It is a gift to gather in a moment where we can see one another, where we can be with one another, whether that is in person, whether that's on Zoom, in all the ways that we can in this day and age. Uh, if you are new, if you've been visiting with us, please help us get to know you. We have plenty of name tags. And stay for visiting in Fellowship Hall after the service. You can stay, come and join us in person if you're here or on Zoom as well. And uh, as we gather, I want to invite folks to turn devices to worship mode, whether that's vibrate or silent. This is a good moment to check, even if you thought you did it before, because uh, I know I have those moments. All right, and I also want to offer that at any time during the service that our hearing assist devices are available, please see one of our ushers and they'll be happy to help. Uh, I have a couple of notes for today. One is our annual jewelry exchange uh, after the service. I want to thank 
Judith Corn Shanahan for coordinating and making that happen this year, um, as she has been doing for many years. And it's a chance to kind of see what people have brought, maybe take home something, um, maybe kind of play and explore, like, what should I be wearing today? I also have a couple of other notes. One, that this coming Saturday uh, is the memorial service uh, for Gary Jamison, who's the son of one of our esteemed late members, Joe Jamison. So I want to encourage folks to come uh, on Saturday. And also, uh, next Sunday is a, our music Sunday with our choir led by Dave Frieden. Um, I would say just come on over and come and check us out for a really good gift of music. It'll be the last choir performance for our program here. Oh, and lest I forget, next Saturday night, next Saturday night is like the cookout. What can you cook on a stick? So let me recommend it. It's over all ages. I'm looking forward to it and enjoying a bit of fire and good company as well. And at this moment, I want to kind of shift gears for uh, a minute and that folks have been offering um, testimonies for our annual uh, campaign for the last several weeks. Um, the annual campaign is our effort to secure commitments for financial pledges as we put together our plans and our budget for the coming year, which begins fiscal year, begins on July 1st. Um, and this morning, uh, because I'm already here, even though it's Mother's Day, I get to offer the message. And I offer this with gratitude because I have a vested interest, certainly as a minister, but really more importantly, as a parent. Uh, I am someone who grew up in Unitarian Universalism. I'm third generation Unitarian, a Unitarian Universalist, and I get to be raising a fourth generation, whether they really consider themselves that or not, there's a fourth generation coming along in my family. And I am so aware, as Antoine de Saint-Exupéry says, we pass the, the, from generation to generation, we offer the passwords of love and our values from one to another. This is such important work that we do and care that we offer to each other. And I want to say, I am so proud of this congregation for all the transitions in the past several years, saying farewell to the previous minister, saying hello to an interim minister and farewell to that minister as well. All of the staff changes in the course of things, welcoming me, welcoming my family, in the middle of, in the very early kind of first year of the pandemic, when we were trying to like not even be around each other, oh gosh, that's so, such a hard way to do church, right? And yet, and yet we survived, and yet we also more than survived. The congregation and this campaign uh, this spring, it's been such a pleasure to be part of this process. I will say, as I, it occurred to me the last few weeks, this is one of the best campaigns I have been around in spirit and in organization in a long time. I don't think you understand just how much wonderful skill and dedication goes into making what we do possible um, and goes into the ministry that, that exists in the scope of this congregation. Um, there is so much that is unseen and so much that is done with love. And it shows up in how we gather and how we are coming together and how we're getting working towards that goal uh, for our annual campaign. It is a joy to be with the congregation, to feel supported and encouraged as a minister, and to look forward to what we will accomplish this year and for the foreseeable future. I am simply here in gratitude and thanks and that we can make all good things happen because we are trying to do this together. Amen. And as part of how we are together and how we welcome each other, I want to share uh, that this is a, one of the things we do in the service is share a moment of greeting our neighbors. And so I invite you to say hello, whether you're in the sanctuary or online. Uh, please, as we are a community of consent, please ask before offering a hug or a handshake. Uh, 
And as you go forth and greet, I will call us back with how we're going to do our first hymn today. So go forth and greet your neighbor. Oh, I knew I had one more. We had two pieces. You had two pieces? Yeah. Oh. I wondered if we can add a piece. We can add some. and come in, enter, rejoice, and come in. Today will be a joyful day. Enter, rejoice, and come in. All right, folks, I'm going to ask you to rise in body or spirit. In part due to COVID and scheduling, I ended up not having a pianist for a bunch of this morning, but we can do this because I made strategic choices about the hymns. So what we're gonna do, remember the theme this month is creativity. So we are going to go with that theme. All right, because I think we can do, we're going to clap together, get to the beat and start singing, enter, rejoice and come in because we can clap on the beat. I have faith. All right, let me do this. So I'm gonna set the tone and we're gonna sing all the verses. Two, three, four, one.
All right, let me invite Jill Thomas up for our opening words this morning. Good morning. We summon ourselves by Reverend Gordon B. McKeeman. And some of you are going to recognize yourself in this reading, I promise. We surround ourselves with the demands and delights of the daily round. From the dirty dishes, the unwaxed floors, from the unmown grass and untrimmed bushes, from all the incompleteness and not yet startedness, from the unholy and the unresolved. We summon ourselves to attend to our vision of peace and justice, of cleanliness and health, of delight and devotion, of the lovely and of the holy, of who we are and what we can do. We summon the power of tradition and the exhilaration of newness, the wisdom of the ages, and the knowing of the very young. I know there's another page. It's stuck. There it goes. We summon beauty, eloquence, poetry, and music to be the bearer of our dreams. We would open our eyes, our ears, our minds, and our hearts to the amplest dimensions of life. We rejoice in the manifold promises and possibilities. I invite Regina Stanley and family up to light our chalice. <clears throat> We light this chalice for mothers and mothering to celebrate those who have taken on the task of nurturing a young, one baby, child, or youth into adult, to celebrate those who have nourished the light of truth and compassion in growing minds and hearts, to celebrate those who have committed time, money, energy to the growth of others in this world. We light this chalice to celebrate and hold dear this flame of love. Thank you, Regina. It's such a gift to see much, so much of your family with you today. And I want to invite, we are about to receive music from the Peoria Recorder Consort. I want to thank them for offering so much of our special music today. They will play two pieces as part of our special music.
lovely. <laughs> so nice. That is so lovely. Thank you. In the course of our gathering, we also recognize so many of the gifts that go into making our time together possible, that go into making it possible for us to gather, as we have been gathering as a congregation for, oh, 180 years at this point. My goodness gracious. We honor all of the ways that people contribute to making the work and the ministry and the mission possible in this place. And part of how we do that is in offering an intentional gift during the service. We receive the offering that sustains and continues our good efforts. And part of what we also do is share that abundance that we receive with our larger community. We practice sharing the plate. So half of the undesignated plate uh, that we receive every Sunday goes to our monthly recipient. In this case, it is the East Bluff Community Center Food Pantry. Um, it's a place where folks can come and choose from a variety of food items, make an order, and then also choose uh, from a meat and a dessert as they are on their way home. Uh, this community, the EBC, serves low-income and unhoused residents, and I think we're all realizing, we're all feeling kind of the crunch about how rising food costs are impacting us. For those who have very little in terms of resources, this is more and more acute every day. Um, and this is such a valuable resource because people can access this pantry twice a month um, and have a reliable place and a resource that they can go to. Uh, this is a charity that is staffed by volunteers entirely and doesn't receive uh, government funding. So this is a body that really depends on the generosity and the grants and so on that it can receive in order to keep going. Uh, so for our share the plate, half of the undesignated offering will go to EBC and half will go to the continued ministry of the church. Uh, please indicate if you're using an envelope, if you're using making it as a pledge or just for a general donation or all for share the plate. Uh, the ushers will pass the plates during our music for meditation. And after the plates have passed, you're welcome to come forward and light candles of care. Thank you for all the generous ways that you give uh, to the work of this congregation and to its work in the world. And now will the ushers please come forward. Thank you. 
Abraham Heschel reminds us that prayer cannot bring water to parched fields, nor mend a broken bridge, nor rebuild a ruined city. But prayer can water an arid soul, mend a broken heart, or rebuild a weakened will. Now is the time for the sharing of the joys and sorrows of this community. We begin with wishes for speedy and complete recoveries to Leila McRae, who is home recovering from an illness, to Kathy and Greg McNeil, who are home recovering from COVID. Kathy asks that you monitor your own symptoms if you had recently been in contact with her. And also, we offer a note to Henry Rakoff, who went to OSF uh, on Friday to recover from a fall. Nancy reports that his scans and x-rays show him to be okay. Is he home at this point? Excellent. Thank you, Nancy. I also want to offer a note of thanks to everyone who supported and participated in the Rally for Democracy on Friday. Um, really, our showing up and being a voice and supporting that effort for human rights, for fair treatment, for uh, being able to recognize the fullness and the breadth and diversity of our humanity, it all makes a difference. We were making a lot of joyful noise, so thank you. I want to recognize, just take a moment to recognize that for many folks, this is Mother's Day. And it is duly wonderful and complicated and difficult. But I offer a note from the Repeal Hide Art Project. We offer love on this Mother's Day to every mother, mom, every caretaker, chosen families, queer mamas, gender queer and trans parents, incarcerated moms, those who wanted to be but were unable to be mothers, moms who have lost their children and children who have lost their moms. For all this and for knowing how complicated this day can be, we offer love and care. Let us hold one more moment, one more shared moment in the quiet for all the joys and sorrows, for all the names and milestones that live in our hearts and remain unspoken. I invite you into a moment of quiet together, and I invite you to breathe with me in this space. Amen and blessings. And now we have the story from Jesse Lachlan. Good morning. Um, so in this month where we celebrate creativity, we are going to engage in a little project together. We will weave together just as we do every Sunday, but this time we'll make a representation of that. Our church is a place where we all come together, each of us bringing a unique piece of ourselves to the fabric of this community. Think about yourself. What do you bring with you on a Sunday morning? What do you appreciate being able to take from the offerings of our community? And what do you want to add in the future? This month, as we ponder and practice creativity, 
you are invited to express those ideas by participating in a community art project. We have so many different sorts of folks here. I can't wait to see what we all gather and create. I wonder where you find weaving in this church. In our UU faith, our ideas, our past, our present. Where do you see weaving as we are as a church community? I remember a game night where someone brought ribbons and we played and danced. Thank you for that, Heather. Do we weave together in the food that we bring to a potluck? A little salad, a little brownies, a little main dish for you? Or when we all bring a dish to the salad luncheon next couple of weekends away? Do we weave together our music with a drum circle or a recorder group or the organ or choir? How about when we wear our shirts, our welcome home shirts out in the community? So think about these things and how we weave ourselves together and select a bit of ribbon, maybe some yarn, Maybe the end of that tattered favorite t-shirt of yours and share some of that with us in Fellowship Hall. Or sort through our supplies and find a piece that calls to you. Is it extra fuzzy? Is it crunchy? Is it shiny and bright? And all of us will use our hands, young, old, artistic, realistic, and make a you unique tapestry. I'll have the kids will be helping me get started during religious education today. So we'll have a good start at it. And you all can add to it throughout this month. And we'll hope to wrap it up on June 4th, which is our church's 100th anniversary celebration of the Flower Communion. So hopefully on that day, we'll get to see what we've all made together. The author and speaker, Anita Morjani, said, In this tapestry of life, we are all connected. Each one of us a gift to those around us, helping each other be who we are, weaving a perfect picture together. I wonder what our picture will look like. I invite the kids to join me now as we head back to religious education. Everywhere you may go. Blessed are the makers by Reverend Marcus Liefert. O oh, you who are the makers, makers of beauty, of paintings and potteries and sculptures, blessed is the making. You who make with hands and hearts and minds, who out of the breath and bones and blood of human lives, blessed are the makers. Blessed are those who make us laugh, who make jokes and faces and toys. Blessed are those who make messes, who make trouble and friends and when needed, make up. Blessed are those who, who make do, who make it last, make it work, make beds and make time for others. 
Blessed are those who make love, who make out and make more and make mistakes. Blessed are those who make coffee and tea, who make conversation, who make meaning in the face of tragedy, who make merriment and awaken joy. Blessed are those who make peace, for they shall inherit the earth. So I think I've been here long enough to realize if it is spring, it must be art season in Peoria. Hallelujah. If it is spring, it must be the beginning of all the art festivals, the art encounters, the art creating and showing and celebrating and so on. There's so much in the schedule that it is hard to make it all. One can't possibly, but boy, one can try. And there is joy and fun in the effort. If it is spring, it must also be the moment when we're entering kind of pride season, specifically lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, and asexual plus affirming in the, the most notable months of May and June and July in particular. I'll offer that in Texas, pride goes all the way to September and October because that's when it's cool enough to have a march. And they do. And it's good. What I so appreciate, of the many things I appreciate about pride, is how it is a sign of the endurance of the human spirit, of the endurance of imagination as a way to survive. How, with pride, there is an abundance of humor and art and color and defiance in the face of denial and erasure. And how that spirit of imagination and perseverance shows up in every person who comes to a pride event or the Trans Day of Visibility we had on May 5th or the Rally for Democracy that also included a lot of our uh, pride range downtown on Friday. More recently in our society, our vocabulary has been growing. Boy, it's been growing in these areas for some time, hasn't it? But it's really been growing in our understanding of drag and celebrating that presence and that power. I want to offer a note from uh, RuPaul, the queen of drag, as we have been hearing uh, in his show, uh, RuPaul's Drag Race in particular. What is drag? This is from the write-up for his masterclass. Drag is a gender-bending art form in which a person dresses in clothing and makeup meant to exaggerate a specific gender identity usually, but not always, of the opposite sex. And while drag's main purpose has been for performance and entertainment, it is also used as a celebration, self-expression of LGBTQ plus pride. And a typical drag show will include lip syncing or dance, and performers often have elaborate clothing and hair and makeup. But I'll say drag is not simply for the show, it is also for coming into our communities in so many ways. This congregation back in January hosted a drag story hour, for in fact, which was lovely and went very well. And we all had a chance to enjoy being in that moment of sharing stories, people of all ages. And I want to offer this note about drag because of how it's one of the many ways its presence invites us into creativity, how this understanding of drag, of kind of coming into uh, a persona in full, uh, in full dress with music and dance possibly in so many ways, 
how that can be so expansive. It allows us to play. This is not simply for a specific uh, group of folks, one identity or another, but this can be for everybody. This understanding of drag allows us to play and discover, define and redefine ourselves, to love ourselves, to cheer for others who are engaged with it. That's why the audience loves a good show. We acknowledge beauty in its many forms. As I've been hearing more recently, drag is love. I want to take a moment as we're talking about um, LGBTQIA plus concerns fairly frequently this spring because of the current efforts to deny and erase people from existence. Make no mistake, that's what's trying to be done. And I recognize that learning about language and identity and orientation, there is a lot to learn, and it keeps changing and evolving. So before I go any further as we're going here, I want to invite us, if you have questions, if you're not sure how to make sense of this, if it's just too complicated and so on, by all means, it's entirely fine to have the conversation about that. Come and find me or Jesse or Regina, we're happy to be with you in this moment. And we're talking about this in a number of different ways as a congregation because this is a congregation with power and privilege and should be one of the bodies that really shows up and say, says something for human rights in this moment. Because this is a congregation that is committed to being welcoming. So we must keep showing up as allies, as partners, boy, hopefully as accomplices, and because we also are diverse within this community. This is us as well. So I just want to recognize how often we're talking about these issues uh, and needs and concerns in the spring, and it's because this is where our conversation is in our society, and this is a body that has to show up. One of the ways that helps us, kind of refreshes and expands our minds and hearts is in fact to be creative. This understanding of pride and all of the art that is surrounding us, it reminds us how we are called to creativity. And one of the best ways to get through and more than survive in this life now, our theme of creativity at its core, a couple of definitions include uh, just simply to make, as we heard the blessings, the blessed are the makers, um, to bring forth in all the different ways we as humans might bring forth um, an idea, a project, a task. It's also, creativity also means to arise, to be born, to increase, and to grow. All of this is the antithesis of destruction. Things will need to fall apart or be deconstructed to make, to make new things. This is true, but it is creativity at its heart is the opposite of destruction. And I want to offer this theme as a reminder of our power now. We're at this end of our congregation's usual year, and we are in the moment of kind of finishing an arc of the work, growing as a people, as a congregation, and preparing for what is to come. You know, in September, we started with belonging. In October, we were with courage. In November was change. December was wonder. In January, finding our center. In February was love, and in March, vulnerability. April was resistance, and this month is creativity, and we'll finish the year of June uh, with delight. So we have been working with and working up to being our more creative and expansive selves, even in the midst of all the complications and the seasons and the challenges of our lives. 
one of the greatest challenges we have is, is kind of our own mentality, our own regard um, that has often been imposed upon us from other sources. Sometimes it's nature, sometimes it's nurture. One of the stories I remember best from Robert Fulgham, uh, Unitarian Universalist minister, author of All I Ever Really Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten, among other works. One of his stories that really sticks out for me is when he talks about how um, when you ask a class of five-year-olds um, to respond to questions about, uh, about art, um, who here can draw? Yes, yes, I can. Yes. Who here can dance? Yes, I can dance. And who can sing? Yes, 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 I can sing. Can I show you now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the class, right? That's the whole class. And then he points out, when we ask the same questions of students in about maybe 10 years or so later, or adults, who can sing? Who can draw? Who can dance? There's this collective awkwardness, a little shuffling, a little deferral, a little denial. Well, you know, I just do it for myself. Yeah, maybe sometimes. No, no, I can't draw. Mm -mm, no, no. That somehow along the way, that art and dance and drawing are somehow has been has been set aside and reserved for people with training and skill, dedication to this, that it's no longer for everyone. Whatever we have absorbed, I will offer that the creative impulse remains within us. So much of adult life is finding ways to get past the limits of what we have taken in and what we have self-imposed upon ourselves. One of our great articulators of the power of creativity, the power of art, is one of our ancestors, Ralph Waldo Emerson. He was a 19th century transcendentalist minister, and he was calling people into a creative, expansive spirit. He was ultimately concerned that we, we as human beings can full, have full access to all of existence. He reminded us again and again of this larger truth. So in his essay on art, he speaks of the purpose of art. He says, because the soul is progressive, it never quite repeats itself, but in every act, attempts the production of a new and fairer whole. This work, this appears in works both of the useful and the fine arts. If we employ the popular distinction of works according to their aim, either at use or beauty, thus in our fine arts, not imitation, but creation is the aim. Not imitation, but creation. He goes on, what is that abridgment and selection we observe in all spiritual activity, but itself the creative impulse? Simply gathering in this moment like we are in this time is part of our expression of the creative impulse. Emerson goes on to talk about how art in any form is a continuous effort of creation connected to life in a way that matters. And it's beyond any particular work, whether practical or fine. He offers that the point is not the object or the result, the finished piece, but the effort and the vision, the process. The process of continually striving as mortal beings we are to respond and connect to follow our intuition and develop our perception. He goes on to say, art has not yet come into its maturity if it, does not, uh, if it does not put itself abreast with the most potent influences in the world, if it is not practical and moral, if it does not stand in connection with the conscience, if it does not make the poor and uncultivated feel that it addresses them, with a voice of lofty cheer, there is higher work for art than the arts. 
There is higher work and it needs to speak to everybody in all of our conditions. Everybody. Emerson includes science and engineering and all creative endeavors, he says. When science is learned in love and its powers are wielded by love, they will appear the supplements and continuations of the material creation. So it's, it was not excluding any forms. It's science, it's engineering, it's all of them. Everything that we are offering into the world. And to do so with heart and with intent and with striving and the continual work and process of it. He says, uh, in nature, all is useful, all is beautiful. Emerson is driving us to the fullness of our possibility of being connected with existence, of being connected with life. He was critical of how um, um, kind of practical arts, for example, or even any kind of art, how often he felt he saw people simply trying to go about it in a mechanical kind of way and not really engaged in feeling. And what he's offering and calling us to is lofty and in some moments, I will say, kind of impossible beyond his demands and expectations. Like, I don't know if I could live with him, but I want to listen to him, right? Whew. The transcendentalists really wanted to rise above this way, life in a way that could... Well, one of the critiques is they could almost rise above life in a way that disconnected from reality, to be honest. However, however, there is so much that is potent in that challenge to kind of get over ourselves, in essence, and to call us to more beyond ourselves, to call us to our aspirations and our answers when we answer the question of why when life calls. There is more love and more joy and more justice out there and in here. In his piece from the Oversoul, Emerson says, Within us is the soul of the whole, the wise silence, the universal beauty to which every part and particle is equally related, the eternal one. When it breaks through our intellect, it is genius. When it breathes through our will, it is virtue. And when it flows through our affection, it is love. He's not only talking about art, right? He's talking about the essence and the power that is all around us, that is we are a part of. Our existential challenge has been always been as human beings that we are deeply connected with this web of existence and we recognize how little control we have over it and it's really frustrating. But we are in it and we keep striving and keep being part of that creation. The work of creativity is our response to life in all of its seasons to come from and to be reminded of and aspire to as expression and relation, being in relationship with this power. It is to keep going. It is to offer effort and that knowing that the effort itself matters, that it has an impact, especially when we feel inadequate and not worthy. My colleague David Breeden says, a work of art is a chance to rework the wounds of time, of self. A work of art is a shot at getting to a true image, a right symbol, a just world even. At the frayed edges, artists swirl, loving, intricate spirits searching. Every work is a shot at getting it right, meaning the world just true at least in the eclectic swirl of the artist's mind. So when we sorrow, when we know death and pain and abuse and injustice, that we can aim for the effort of being creative, of being, of trying to create our world again, and that it is worth trying. It is worth 
the effort and the striving and the hope. It is an opportunity to say yes, to co-create, to make a mess. I think this is part of the grace that is offered and informs art forms such as drag. We can keep trying and imagining and exploring and sharing that and then going back to the drawing board again. Because creation, this bringing forth, is not a one-time act. It is that we might survive for one, that we might continue in our existence, but two, that we might more than survive, that we might live and remember that we are part of such abundance and such beauty. As human beings, we persist. We can't help ourselves. We keep finding creative ways and creative solutions with whatever life throws at us. So let us go forth in this reminder of the deep power, as Emerson calls it, what nourishes us in the most trying of times as well as in the most wonderful of times. Out of love, we keep up with this effort. Out of love, we endure. Out of love, we keep showing up. Out of love, we keep creating. So let us go forth and continue with this great project that we know of as life, that we might discover it more fully and help our neighbors and our friends also be part of that effort as well, because we are all deeply, deeply interconnected. Let us go forth and continue in that spirit. Amen. For our closing hymn, I want to offer number 118. It is this little light of mine, and I have faith that we can do this, because we're going to learn how to clap on the two and the four, not the one and the three. I'm just telling you right now, we can do this as well. It's good to actually have practice in this. So if you could rise and body your spirit, we're going to do the clap. We're going to clap this out again and sing the three verses. So it's this little of mine. So it's this little light of mine. Now I'm going to let it shine. When we take fire from our chalice, it does not become less, it becomes more. And so we will extinguish our chalice. We take its light and its warmth with us, multiplying their power by all our lives and sharing it with the world.
sphere of life, sphere of love, we had gathered under the banner of a shared faith. We are born of a welcoming grace that extends and receives love. We are touched by the ways we have fallen short of who we strive to be, and we are reborn, forged by a greater courage, a greater creative impulse in our lives. Let us move forth from this space, encouraged and refreshed for the journey ahead. Our worship is ended. Let our service begin. Thank mm-hmm. you. 